My name is Vasily Sardakov, and I would like to present you the actors framework. Uh, the first question which I want to try, for answer for which I want to try to find is uh, why do we need another framework? Because we have a lot of frameworks, why another one? Could you speak up a bit, please? Sure. Uh, so, just for recap, uh, Intel is GX offer new system components, so called enclaves. Enclaves are part of user space applications, and they are isolated from, and the code on data of enclaves are isolated from that of other enclaves. So an enclave can, the, let's say, code from enclave can access data located in ring four inside application, but cannot access data and code inside another enclave. And enclaves are protected from attacks based on physical access by the use of encryption of physical memory, uh, removes the operating system and the hypervisor from the rustic computing base, and offer very interesting features like local remote attestation and data sealing and, and more. Uh, Intel offers uh, um, Intel SGX SDKs. This SDK provides you necessary primitives to uh, program enclaves, and they do this in a very straightforward and easy way. So you can create a um, function and decorate it in a special way, then compile this function together with the Intel SGX SDK, and SDK generates uh, a binary or multiple binaries of enclaves and glue code, uh, which allows to start or deploy enclaves. Um, and this is a very intuitive use, so it's just an RPC-like manner of programming of enclaves. However, there is a problem. Um, to enter into enclave, you need to perform something called O-call. So there are mechanisms for switching between untrusted and trusted execution environments, and those transitions are very, very slow. Compared to ordinary system calls, uh, switching between trusted and untrusted 50 times slower, and more than 50 times slower, it's only it's for, for the beginning. And you will need to leave your enclave very, very soon, because inside enclave you cannot directly interact with the kernel, so if you want to interact with the kernel or use a function which is not located inside an enclave, you need to leave this enclave. Again, 50 times slower. For example, you have two threads. Those two threads need to pass a critical section. They need to use mutexes. Mutexes require the involvement of the kernel. Both threads need to leave the enclave. We have more than 200 times slower synchronization mechanism compared to ordinary mutexes. So it's very, very slow. Uh, as a response for this issue, uh, researchers provided several frameworks. Uh, frameworks like Heaven, Scone, Graphene SGX, SGX, LKL, uh, Panoply, and maybe some other. So more than five different frameworks, uh, and they follow the um, same and different approaches at the same time. So you don't need to leave an enclave if you can do everything what you need inside an enclave. So for example, you can emulate some unavailable system calls inside an enclave, and therefore you don't need to leave the enclave. And uh, various projects abstract different layers of the software stack. So someone has abstract um, the LibSieve interface, another project abstracts the whole, the, the, let's say, the um, kernel interface. Uh, but conceptually, conceptually, those frameworks have problem. Um, it's a monolithic design with a lot of, with a very huge trusted computing base. So and this is a kind of irony. You wanted to remove the complicated kernel from the trusted computing base, but to run your legacy application, you anyway put parts of the kernel inside this trusted environment. So large TCV is the problem. However, there is another way. And um, a single host, uh, a single process can host multiple enclaves. And this is a very interesting feature of uh, SGX enclaves. Inside the one memory uh, isolated environment, you can put multiple, I mean process, you can put multiple enclaves. So y your program can consist of multiple mutually distrusted components located inside different enclaves. What can be, what application can be? For example, you have a message server, like a SMPP server, and you want to make um, group chats. You can put uh, one group chat inside one enclave, 
another group chart, another, another enclave, so they will be protected. And in the case of interusion, this data will be protected, obviously. And at the same time, since it's the one single uh, service, um, clients should, you, or should have a mechanism for, to interact through uh, enclaves. Another example was considered by um, people from Microsoft, thank you, very nice, exact, multi-party computation. When you have mul multiple mutually distrusted binaries, but those binaries, be which belong to different owners, should perform um, mathematical function or find a consensus or make a decision together without, without uh, exposing of internal values. In a simple case, you have several uh, in, in isolated parties. Each party has, uh, is located inside an enclave. For example, this enclave has a secret value inside, and three parties should uh, perform a mathematical sum without in exposing of open values. So for that, again, you need to have multiple enclaves. You need to have a mechanism for interaction between them. And at the same time, it should be uh, one unique application, but not a distributed set of isolated or distributed set of mm, different applications. And to implement such applications, you need to have a programming framework and you need to have um, necessary system support. And uh, I think the right way is to do this uh, by the applying of the actor, of the conception of actors. Because Actors conceptually are not blocking entities, and and they and they follow the conception of no sharing. So you don't need to involve synchronization primitives. Uh, so you don't need to live in an enclave. You don't need to develop mechanism for synchronization within the enclave. So it's very easy. So they don't use logs. Um, and conceptually, they are very lightweight. So it's a very nice from uh, the point of view of another problem related to SGX enclaves. Uh, it's an EPC problem. So there is a problem of paging if the size of all enclaves reaches, uh, let's say, near 92 megabytes. So actors. And of course, there are many actor-based systems. And the problem that they're very heavy. It's very complicated. Well, it's not very complicated to port, let's say, Erlang VM into SGX. The question is, what overhead will you have if you port this? So we we can use, but with very high overhead, Erlang, uh, Java, and conceptually, those frameworks are not tailored for um, trusted execution environment. So yes, you can run it, but they are not. They they don't use features of um, enclaves. And that's the reason why I decided that we need another framework. And I will present it today. So uh, it's uh, eActors is an actor-based framework. Um, as many other actor-based frameworks, uh, to describe it, I will answer three questions. What an actor is? What is an actor? Uh, how does actor communicate? And what system support uh, the framework provides? Um, this figure shows a general view of the actor of the application, of an application written in this framework. So um, there are several enclaves, one and two, uh, and there are actors. Um, they are called e-actor in the, it's a notion of a, an actor in this framework. So um, there are four actors, and um, two actors are located inside one enclave, two other actors are located in another enclave, and there are workers. Uh, workers uh, technically are P threads, physical threads, uh, that provide execution context for actors. So actors itself are passive entities and they can act only if they have uh, execu um, execution context. And there are bindings between uh, actors and enclaves. For example, you see two actors inside this enclave, two actors inside this enclave. Uh, workers to CPUs, it's a CPU affinity. You can say that this thread will work, will be attached to this CPU. That can be very useful from the point of view of performance and optimization and uh, actors to workers. Uh, as I said, uh, workers provide execution context. Um, to create this application, you need to uh, uh, have the framework, uh, the source code of your actors, and uh, the XML file um, that describes uh, the deployment scenario itself. So uh, the, B, the, the, the number one aim of the framework is to provide the very simple tools which help you to build a very flexible application. Today, for example, you want to put all actors inside one enclave. Tomorrow, let's say you want to have five different enclaves. And the, the switching between actors, between enclaves, should be very, very mm, easy from the point 
point of view of the developer. And the uh, deployment scenarios are encoded in uh, or are stored inside uh, an XML, uh, while uh, you don't need to fix uh, the source code of your um, application if you want to change the uh, deployment. Uh, the framework itself generates um, binary binaries of uh, enclaves. So, for example, if you have five enclaves, uh, the framework will generate you five different enclaves, and each enclave will have only uh, used inside this enclave uh, source code of actors. So, the very lightweight, without um, unnecessary uh, code inside. Um, and this is a very simple application, so there is a constructor for an actor, so this uh, a constructor initializes, uh, usually initializes uh, um, uh, communication interface between other actors, and the uh, actor, uh, this is the body function of the actor. So by definition, an actor uh, can interact with other actors only by messages, so actually what's going on, uh, we receive or send message and we, we react, we re uh, this actor reacts if this uh, actor receives a message punk from another actor. Uh, question number one, how this actor can interact with each other? And they use uh, nodes, uh, it's an uh, abstraction which describes, it's a fundamental abstraction for, message, for messaging. So um, it's technically it's a part of memory, and this part of memory can be uh, trusted, located inside an enclave, or can be untrusted, located outside an enclave. Um, it consists of two components. There is a header and there is a payload. So uh, it's a just there is payload, is memory for data, and there is a header. Header is used to enqueue, uh, to enqueue multiple nodes into queues. And all nodes are located at the start, so it's part of the framework. Uh, the, um, the framework provides API to deal with those uh, queues, so very obvious, uh, double linked list with uh, Li4 and 5 for interfaces. Um, synchronization of um, nodes are protected by the use of hardware local lesion. Uh, it's a very, very high performance synchronization mechanism without any side effects. Uh, compared <coughs> without any side effects. Um, and uh, this primitive can be used uh, by multi-producers and multi-consumers. So you just have a queue, there you, you have a set of factors that can write to this queue and set of factors that read from this queue. Uh, let's consider an example. We have two actors, Ping and Pong, and they're located inside different <coughs> enclave. To, to send a message from enclave one to enclave two, uh, the first actor should uh, have access to pool of empty messages and uh, to inbox abstraction. So uh, firstly, Ping needs to uh, dequeue an empty node from the pool, um, right, uh, and after that, uh, the first um, actor will get exclusive access to this node. No one else can read and write it and even access or refer somehow. Uh, then enclave can, uh, that uh, actor can write data inside this enclave, uh, inside this node. Then this node must be uh, enqueued into an inbox. So data, man, by, by the way, can be encrypted or non-encrypted. Um, should be enqueued into an inbox. And at the same time, uh, the second actor tries to dequeue messages from the same inbox. And succeed, <coughs> it will get um, success, it will get um, exclusive access again. Uh, safely read data inside the enclave, decrypt it if, if, if it's necessary, and then it needs to re it, ne it need return um, it needs to return uh, use it node back to the pool. So very simple, and uh, this abstraction uh, can be as I said be, can be used by multi producers and multi consumers, uh, but by default communication are not encrypted. So you because because of multiple reasons. And uh, the framework provides more complicated uh, abstractions on top of this very simple interface. Uh, those abstractions are called Karkos connectors. And they provide uh, encrypted, uh, can, can be encrypted and non-encrypted uh, with absolutely the same interface. So for example, today you have two actors. You place it, those two actors inside an enclave. And obviously, you don't need to use encryption. Because uh, and because those um, actors are protected by uh, SGX itself, so therefore you don't need to spend time to encrypt it. But tomorrow, let's say you want to create two independent enclaves, put two different actors into different enclaves, and obviously you need to have a mechanism for 
which, which you encrypt your messages. And cargo C connectors offer this abstraction, so with the same source code, just by switching one or two source line of code, you can turn your uh, non-encrypted messages into encrypted messages. However, of course, uh, there are, um, it's not for free, so uh, this interface can be used only by single producer, single consumer, peer-to-peer uh, -peer form. Um, but uh, the framework uh, for mechanisms for remote, uh, uh, for local attestation uh, during the key exchange procedure. So if you have, uh, let's say, five enclaves with five different actors, and those actors uh, have five, in the four, let's say, independent uh, communication channels, the framework will generate necessary glue, uh, necessary um, checksums, which will help you to establish uh, encrypted connections by the use of local attestation. Uh, what's, what else? Uh, the framework offers um, several system components because uh, you cannot use, well, you shouldn't use uh, e-calls inside an enclave uh, and therefore you need to use messages to get access to system components that are unavailable inside the enclave. Um, for that, the framework offers uh, system uh, actors. They are untrusted, they're working outside enclaves, and they interact with uh, all other actors by the messages because it's an uh, actor-based framework. So, for example, um, and those actors implement mechanisms. So that can be a system call for read, for write, for pipe, for interaction with pipe, uh, read, write to the file system if you want. So uh, it's just mechanism. And uh, you, for example, if you want to open a file, you need to send a message. This actor will uh, perform this mechanism. Uh, op it will open the, the, the file and send back uh, file descriptor. So the same system actor can be simultaneously used by multiple uh, other actors because, because it doesn't uh, store, uh, it doesn't have a state. Uh, another thing, so now we can uh, have access to any hardware from our enclaves with the same interface. Um, and, but anyway, sometimes you need to have a mechanism to, uh, uh, to, don't, uh, <coughs> to store data inside an enclave without share the state. It sounds a bit strange. I will explain. So um, conceptually actors cannot have state and cannot have access to shared uh, entity. But at the same time, uh, instead of saying, for example, you have a one message and you need to send this message to, let's say, five or 10 uh, actors. And since this message is absolutely the same, uh, sending five or 10 sequential messages is inefficient. So in, uh, in actors-based framework, uh, there is a conception of uh, object store, which is not a store as a shared entity. So you may consider object store as a, a set of queues, a, a set of persistent queues, where you put data, but in, into this queue, but this uh, data can be accessed by or written by multiple actors without without any problems. So uh, the framework offers uh, the e actors object store. It's a, technically it's a k atomic k value store. Uh, it can be private, it can be public, so it's not an active entity, it's a set of uh, APIs. Uh, so a, a, a set of APIs that can be invoked by uh, actors. So any piece of memory, if it uh, has a necessary size, can be turned into um, object store and uh, actors who has access to it can uh, read and write to this store. Um, also, this um, store can be persistent. For example, you can uh, map um, a, a file into untrusted memory and uh, turn this mapped memory into an object store. So it will have uh, persistence on demand. Uh, that's all regarding the design. Um, the question which I want to show you, uh, the answer later, is to show you how to, how fast is the communication primitives. Because uh, the original motivation was uh, we want to omit the use of uh, e-calls and o-calls, and for that we use asynchronous messages. Are uh, how f how fast are they? Uh, for that, uh, let's consider uh, two two actors located inside different enclaves, 
And uh, in this case, they use uh, uh, e-calls to leave an enclave to send the message to another one, uh, and uh, messages used by and and boxes used by two different uh, actors written on top of the framework. So uh, there is this very simple ping pong um, example uh, with uh, one million messages. With uh, those messages um, have uh, different size, starting from 16 bytes up to one megabyte, half of a megabyte. Uh, two threads, so there is thread one, there is thread two, everything is uh, honest. Again, uh, different threads, uh, just uh, the same actors, just different uh, synchronization mechanism. Um, this is the performance of, uh, of the SDK. Um, as you can see, there is a pike, uh, which is near 32K. Uh, it's uh, exactly the size of the first line cache. Um, because when you transfer message from a uh, trusted area to trusted by the use of all calls, there is a marshalling mechanism which copies data from one memory to another. And uh, obviously, if this memory fits into the L1 cache, uh, this works very, very fast. So this is the end of the cache, and it has, let's say, steady a layer after 128K. And this is the performance for your actor, so much, much faster. Uh, very fast. Um, and because I was using in this example um, cargo, so as I said, you can very easily to switch from to switch a cargo from encrypted into non-encrypted form and vice versa. Uh, this is the performance for encrypted cargos. So uh, encrypted, even encrypted cargos are approximately three times faster than non-encrypted non-encrypted call based messages. And the difference between um, um, non-encrypted cargos and equals approximately 30 times. So this interface is very fast and you can write very, very high performance application on top of this framework. Uh, sources are available. Uh, you can check if you want. Uh, there are several examples here. Uh, there is a template so which, uh, which shows uh, an ordinary Hello World application. Um, there, are, um, there is a set of various pine pongs that use encrypted, non-encrypted, uh, cargo-based and non-cargo-based messages. Also, there is network uh, version of this pine pong application. Um, and there is a huge set of various forms of local attestation, Diffie-Hellman uh, and something else. Uh, so at least there's uh, three different uh, pine pongs uh, which use different uh, mechanisms to establish an encrypted connection. Um, also, there is an example for secure multi-party computation. It's a secure SUM, or SUM, uh, the e actors object store, and uh, there is an HTTP web server uh, which uh, provides SSL connection. Um, mm, yes, uh, unfortunately, this address is wrong, but there is a service primat. Uh, dot .ibr here should be primat. It's the title, it's a group site, uh, um, it's a site of our group, uh, and uh, this site is um, hosted on top of the framework. So it shows how, how exactly you can terminate SSL inside an enclave, and how you can write a HTTP-based application on top of this framework. Uh, let's talk about future plans. Uh, because this project was a kind of a research project, it, it's written in C, very safe language, obviously. Uh, you may ask a lot of questions about the applicability of this framework in general. And one of the primary problems uh, is how to make the programming language and the environment more, uh, let's say, more safe. So uh, currently um, I'm working on the hardening of, uh, of, uh, of the framework. Here will be instrumentation mechanism um, provided by LLVM, uh, which will uh, limit a me of memory that can be accessed by different actors. So we, at the end, this mechanism will help um, solve problems related to um, um, uncontrolled access to memory by the C language. Uh, mechanisms for partitioning uh, because uh, the framework provides mechanism for easy um, uh, deployment uh, and obviously it will be nice to have a mechanism to self 
deployment or uh, self partitioning of and of actors because actors are independent that uh, they can be split it without or partitioned without any any dependencies and problems so this is the another direction of the work uh, of course multi enclave applications so the, so the framework was developed to um, to give a tool to build such multi enclave applications uh, the um, HTTP server will be improved, uh, it will support multiple domains uh, and uh, um, there, is, there, is, uh, there, is, there are some additional ideas related to IoT. And uh, uh, currently the framework uh, relies on the Intel SGX SDK which is not very good from performance from security point of view so probably we will try to uh, remo remove this legacy. So. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, questions? Yes, please. Uh, so you compared yourself against the SGX SDK, but the SGX SDK also nowadays supports switches. Uh, yes. Calls and uh, they are more performant than doing vocal all the time, right? So how does that compare against this? Uh, I cannot give you numbers, but conceptually, uh, all the synchronous queues are synchronous called by SGX SDK. This uh, interface, they absolutely, I mean, conceptually, is the same. You have two threads, one thread inside the enclave, one, say, one thread another, uh, outside the enclave, and there is shared memory which is used to enqueue and dequeue data. So it will be the primitive, as, as a pri primitive, it's near the same. As implementation, well, uh, I cannot compare with switchless call but calls, but uh, mm, there is no many things that you can apply. So you can use atomic instructions, you can use hardware local region, and you can use uh, nothing else. So maybe two two approaches uh, and spin locks. So three different approaches. So the mm, near the same performance, actually. I mean, they scales differently, but conceptually uh, the same. So you can assume that uh, switchless calls mean has near the same performance. Yes, please. Hi. Um, I, I work on a, a project called Enarch, which is uh, also using D, but uh, I'm interested in some of the differences in what you're doing. Um, what, um, this doesn't have anything, you don't do anything regarding attestation of the D, right? You leave that entirely to the application because that's one of the hard bits, is making sure that you're talking to the actual genuine hardware and not something that's being emulated. Uh, and so in the, normal, in the usual model, one application needs to test before it's loaded. In this case, you can have multiple Uh, so the question is uh, how local attestation works. I will paraphrase this if you don't yeah. mind. Um, so the framework uh, provides um, uh, primitives to create uh, encrypted channels by the use of local attestation. And uh, uh, during the compiling phase, uh, the um, environment generates uh, signatures, so a mere enclave, if you know what is it, uh, signatures of each enclave. And uh, you need to have, let's say, the root of trust. So some, uh, one enclave that includes all mere enclaves um, signatures inside. So it's a sequential process. There is a root of trust, there is the first enclave. This enclave has a set of all or maybe subset of enclaves or uh, communication uh, channels, and then you establish one, two, three, four, five, let's say, and sequentially uh, they perform uh, local attestation. So of course it uh, cannot be very general approach, so uh, currently it's tailored for sequential initialization of uh, enclaves and sequential generation of uh, encrypted channels. Uh, but uh, this uh, job significant, this uh, environment significantly reduces uh, the complexity of this procedure. So if you can map your application to uh, uh, this design, so like uh, you can uh, sequentially establish connections between several enclaves, yes, you can apply um, this framework immediately and the framework will generate necessary parts. Otherwise, well, but otherwise you will need to um, create, let's say, a zygote or something very initial, very, very root of, root of trust, and this root of trust will establish connections between different enclaves. So this will require you to modify the framework. Yes, please. Well, we just said the word identi identification. So uh, 
what about the namespace problems? How do these guys actually know about each other and uh, have their this related to the question of object star, which always uh, uh, was uh, a bit of a problem in parallel architectures with virtual machines and so on. Somewhere you have a repository and uh, this has to be managed and it tends to become a big mess uh, because someone has to look after this. So do you solve all these problems by being stateless? How do you get rid of the mess <laughs> once you've joined with these five entities to a consumer? Very, very good question. Uh, the question is, what about uh, namespace uh, inside, the inside the network, uh, inside the framework, uh, to distinguish different uh, actors? And uh, I would say, no, there is no mechanism. There is no mechanism for that, because you are absolutely right. So um, name discovery, so or disco or mechanism which uh, maps, uh, that maps uh, actors to unique names, uh, well, would be it's very complicated in general in distributed systems. So uh, in the framework, um, there is a mechanism for naming and identification of actors at the source code level. So a tool which um, a tool that generates uh, binaries knows something about source code of actors and their names, uh, but uh, there is no independent mechanism for name discovery. Jo, your question? Uh, I wouldn't say that it's a very recent, so this diagram, let's say, two years old. Yes, yes so then it's either old, or because now we're in a situation where uh, of current Intel processors, due to the microprocessor updates, you need to push the L1 cache, so your entry and exit events become even more, um, more expensive, basically. I would say that uh, each, uh, each micro code update <coughs> cuts performance. <laughs> <laughs> very, very significant, I would say. <laughs> so, this is the problem of updates. So, so maybe as a, let's say, high-level opinion question, do you think it was maybe a wrong design decision to have uh, an initial SDK where entry and exits are basically modeled as operating system level system calls, and you see that operating systems, uh, both in software and hardware, have been highly optimized for fast system call entry exits. I mean, exactly the inverse. Every time we learn more about this, it becomes more uh, more expensive to enter exit. Uh, the question is: uh, Do uh, I, is this the right way to use messages instead of uh, e-calls? Uh, at the beginning, I did not consider. So at some mom moment, for some applications, I thought that uh, the use of e-calls is okay, but uh, now I don't think so. So I, I still believe that, uh, and I see this in numbers, that asynchronous interface is much better. However, it has significant uh, drawback uh, because you cannot stop a thread inside an enclave, and this thread anyway will need to leave the enclave at some moment. So, uh, and, and which means that anyway, at some moment, for some reason, uh, or due to the reasons of scalability, all m any of my thread will leave an enclave. So in some form, a call still exists, but the programming model doesn't rely on this. That, that's the important. This is important. Yes, please. Time for another question? Please. Okay. Um, well, first of all, first of all, can you stick to the message model to access uh, the, the string? Um, uh, but uh, in the recent... Oh, sorry. I, I, How much time do you have? No, no, just to take time. About 34. Oh, yes, I, I got it again. Yes, um, please. So, um, well, these, these problems of multi party computation uh, are typically solved by using multiple physical entities that people really distrust each other. So, really everyone has his, his own machine or virtual machine and then got message files and messages back and forth. So, what you're suggesting is actually um, to get put all, bring all to one single CPU and therefore get more efficiency because stuff is running more locally. Now this bears the question, um, if we have these distributed models right now, 
Um, can you map them to your local thing? So assume this stuff is already running and people agree, okay, we want to do this 10 times uh, more efficient. We run it on a single CPU, but we need some kind of translation process to now get this distributed um, things onto a single machine. Um, any ideas about this? Uh, first of all, yes. Uh, distributed uh, problems of distributed computing um, applied for this design absolutely uh, without any accents, let's say. Uh, I also consider this form of secure multi-party computation is a, a mechanism to improve performance, exactly. So instead of, uh, let's say, five different um, separate machines, like servers located in different countries, let's say, you have a platform where you upload your binaries and, you, and they, they represent your original server. And in this local in this local place, they can compute much faster, and then go back. Let's say that. So that's the design uh, in the background. But but of course, the problems related to try, I mean uh, consensus, every funny BFT, a raft, and other stuff can be applied and should be. Of course, we we, we don't solve this, and we cannot solve this. I think. Well, it would be interesting if you just press a button and your distributed instance ends up on your CPU in an enclave, and then. Okay, thank you. Yes. I so you mentioned before, like you can't stop the enclave, and then at some point maybe you have to all call out, and that's not great. Um, when you schedule your actor, do you try to minimize that? So can you can you schedule in a way that uh, you can keep a small number of cores busy all the time, and then they never have to all call out because there's always something another actor can schedule on that core, you know? Uh, firstly, uh, you can uh, provide uh, some mechanisms for, so the mechanism for setting um, affinity was ed exactly for this. So when you want to collocate your uh, code and data within the same, co on the same core, and if you want to, and if you need a mechanism for scheduling, that o this mechanism also can be implemented uh, at the assignment level, not inside in the source code. However, um, this not, mm, it's not the primary approach to solve this problem. I mean, the problem when you need to leave an enclave. Uh, the best way I found, it's not a part of the framework, but uh, you need to have, um, let's say, at some moment when you cannot uh, get a message, you need to leave an enclave manually. But you do this for, uh, mm, r not random, but uh, let's say statically identif uh, statistically identified uh, in per interval of time. There is nothing better. Oh, I don't know. Thank you.